Welcome to the first edition of Agony's Embrace, the Texas Rangers podcast. This is a podcast by two lifelong Texas Ranger fans, two guys who have been through all the suffering and all the agony that the Rangers have to offer. And we're here to talk about this season and hopefully the next season if this goes well. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're going to focus on the 60-game joke gimmick season. And joining me is my lifelong friend and fellow baseball fan, Ben, King of Funny Rogers. How are you, Benny boy? Oh, doing as well as one might imagine during the start of the season. But drinking a White Claw, just hoping our bullpen can uh, duct tape it together. Well, the bullpen is a huge issue because Jose LeClerc went down with an injury, and he was far and away the best arm in that bullpen. Jose was a guy with an electric fastball. He had that very bizarre changeup that he calls the slombio, which is like a slider changeup. It's a nasty pitch. When you couple it with the fastball with that much movement, he was a very lethal pitcher. Two years ago, he looked all-star caliber, exceptional closer, ended the season on a very long save streak. Last season, became very erratic, had a lot of trouble. There was a season, sort of season-defining series early on against the Arizona Diamondbacks where he got slapped around badly and lost his closer job. That sort of set the tone for the season. And with Leclerc going down, the Rangers don't have a lot to go to. You can sort of talk about their options, Ben. Jesse Chavez, one of your favorite players, being the guy, like the veteran guy who shit's really hitting the fan, Break in case of emergency. Jesse Chavez, here we go. And it's just like, this guy's average at best. And he has been his entire career. But And we, we also cannot forget uh, Montero, who they, the Rangers signed, but is out. Because he was a good addition by John Daniels uh, on paper. But there's not many options. Um, which, I, that can be remedied. Uh, there's many things that we can do to fix our bullpen. But what what alarms me even more, and the bullpen struggles are kind of like, to be expected, but what alarms me more is just our anemic offense. That oh. just, the worst run support, and th- this sounds like a broken record f- from past seasons, but the worst run support for starting pitchers uh, in the league, uh, it just absolutely abysmal uh and, and then the only times we do score runs is when our starters do fuck up. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, I guess is good. I mean, that's glad, I'm glad that they're actually competing then, but it'd be nice if we can score five runs not when we're down 5-0 like we were today. You know, to me, the thing that is most troubling about the offense is how many holes there are. In the past, when the Rangers have sort of been contending for a playoff spot or Bill this above average before the season a lot of times it was well we have Beltre and Elvis and Young and these spots filled up with good players and a couple good outfielders but it was first base is a gaping hole catcher is a gaping hole you look at this lineup it's scary there is not a lot in this lineup basically you have Todd Frazier was the only significant offseason signing and he's doing decent he's doing pretty well it's it's sort of disgusting that he's playing first because between Greg Bird and Guzman, the highly touted Guzman, they couldn't get a single starter between them. So the fact that Frazier's playing first base is sort of eye-roll worthy, but he's been getting some timely hits, especially over the last four or five days, Frazier's really heated up. What have you thought about Frazier, his performance? Honestly, one of the the bright spots for me, I I had a lot of negativity about his signing, thinking that he was uh, g- just going to be an overpaid uh, band aid over the third base position, uh, who an aging an aging player who's had a good career. Don't get me wrong, uh, Todd Frazier's a very good professional baseball player. Solid, but above I, average, I would call him. I thought it was just a a band aid on the actual problem of that hole at third base. But now, now looking at it, uh, not even at the third base part, because like you said he's playing first. It, 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 every time I see him in the lineup, it's the one of the only positions I look at and I, ha- I feel some confidence in. Some. Yep. Uh, he he brings stability to our lineup, which 
is something that a few years ago, if we would have added Todd Frazier, he would have been supplementing the lineup, right, not right. being not being you know the go-to guy batting fourth or fifth as he has recently. And uh, but to be fair, I'm honestly uh, very very happy with his performance so far, and I hope he keeps it up because he seems like a good veteran, a good a locker room presence. Um, because Lord knows, like you said, th- it is scary looking at that lineup and that roster. Um, because I, in past years, like you said, we've had a lot of good position players and like Michael Young, and we, we've always had pl- people there that have been around and have played those positions. But now, th- for the first time in many, many years, I have no confidence in our offensive uh, capability especially in a in a ballpark that seems to have limited uh offensive capabilities. The new ballpark seems like it plays like Dodgers Stadium. The way that the hitters talk about it, the way that the games play out, the lack of homers. Initially the ballpark was billed as very similar to the old bar, ballpark but slightly more pitcher friendly. I think what we're beginning to see is this is a pretty pitcher friendly ballpark. There's not any sort of jet stream or wind effect like we had in the old ballpark in the early 2000s. And to me, I think that it's interesting to consider the effect that the ballpark is having on the pitching because we look at the Rangers and say, God, the pitching's really good. Lynn's having a phenomenal season. And in general, the starters are doing well. The starter ERA was very low. Miner's gotten lit up a couple times his last couple starts, and that sort of worries you, but... Overall, I think the stadium will have a positive impact on the Rangers overall going forward because I was watching an interview with Buck Showalter, the managerial anthrax, and he actually said that when he was managing the Rangers in the early 2000s, remember that was one of those just incredible infields of like A-Rod, Michael Young, Hank Blaylock, and Tex. An infield on paper you look at and you're like, how are you not going to win the division with an infield like this? Of course, Showalter never won shit with the Rangers. But here's the punch. Showalter said that he couldn't get any free agent pitchers interested in coming to Texas because of the heat. And, like, he would talk with pitchers, like, trying to recruit them, and he would hear, like, through the grapevine and through people's agents that the Texas heat was so extreme, people didn't want to come fucking pitch in hot-ass Texas in the small stadium. Now that the Rangers have a more balanced stadium and a stadium with AC, I think that they could actually land some big-name free agent pitchers in the future. Granted, Josh Daniels make them a competitive offer and not lowball them like he did Anthony Rendon this season, starting with the five-year deal. One thing I was going to go back to real quick before I comment on that was the Rangers have not had a game with their roof open yet. So we have not seen... The differences between uh, that ro- that AC, com- you know, the closed uh, closed roof and an open roof, because as we know, that hot, humid heat, uh, you know, in DFW area can certainly carry a ball. So I'm interested to see how that plays out. But you're right; it definitely plays way more pitcher friendly, and I don't mind that because, like you said, with Buck Walter, he had a hard time signing uh, people because of the heat. Um, but uh, the, my second point was. That that just makes that it makes me laugh because thinking about how hard the Rockies have it here in Colorado, trying to sign a a, a marquee starting pitcher to come and move here, where a, 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 a can of corn, a little a can of corn, could be a home run in that stadium with the altitude, and th- to say, oh, we, I couldn't sign players because they didn't want to play in the heat. Buck, half of these players are from the Dominican, Venezuela. I mean, they they're from tropical climate areas. I can I think they can handle DFW humidity. Okay, like it's not. I mean, if Houston, maybe maybe not. That's a whole other story. But I just think that that's funny because half of those players and the, the the demographics of baseball play in hot, humid areas. So that, that's a good point. I think a lot of it had to do with the dimensions too, but. To me, it's just, as a fan, the fact that you don't have to sit out there and languish in the Texas heat is a huge deal. I mean, you've done it. Yeah, oh, plenty of times. And I don't know how much the roof will actually affect the free agent signings, but let me tell you, 
once this COVID shit ends and everything normalizes in terms of attendance, you're going to see higher consistent attendance because if you never went to the Rangers ballpark in Arlington, which I would venture to say is a very small percent of people watching this video, you know that even in games that started at 7, no matter what month, May, August, didn't matter, it would still be extremely hot. You're sitting down after a long day of work at 7, you're touching that hot-ass green seat, and it's miserable. It's it's still really hot even at 7. Exactly. So, to me, whenever the Rangers were like, oh, we're building a new stadium, my first thought was, well, why? The other one opened in, like, 95. Then my other thought was, wait a second. Is that going to be air-conditioned? Because that's, ga- that's the real game-changer. It's just a I, damn shame that the first year is not going to have any fans. That's just awful. One, it's, it's terribly sad, and for a lot of sports, I mean, the the Las Vegas Raiders won't have anyone in their giant fucking stadium either. I mean, there's a lot of places that are not going to be able to put fans into where they they should be. Um, so I, it makes me sad having to see cardboard cutouts in VR, but uh, I, I really do think that Overall, the stadium, like you said, is going to help the team, uh, if not with with transactions, with at least maybe performance. Because I, I'll, I will take a dip in offense for a little increase in pitching uh, any day of the week, especially in the AL. So, and and to me, what makes it so exciting is it's not just like point three ERA points worth of pitching help; it's consistent and. It's consistent change that can be replicated in the future. Like, oh, people are no longer really scared of coming here. That's a big deal. Well, regardless, I think if we're taking a look at this season, one of the things that we have to talk about is how easy the Rangers' schedule is in the early part relative to how difficult it gets at the end. And that mixed with the fact that the season is only 60 games which essentially means one game is the equivalent to three. This incredibly weak start is very troubling, Ben, especially when you look at teams like the Giants, who have a lineup full of AAA-tier players, and the Rangers couldn't even win that series. That's very troubling. Very. uh, But at the same time, I don't know how many of our players have... I mean, I and I guess you could say this with for the Giants as well, but I don't know how much knowledge and familiarity they have with uh, NL teams, especially playing in. Uh, why am I blanking AT&T on the name? Stadium. A, yeah, AT and T Stadium. I wanted to say Cubby Cove, but the, that's, that's right field. Uh, so I, I'm not going to use that as an excuse, but it, like it, it's it's very disappointing because y- you think that. But our team, which is basically an, a glorified AAA team right now, if you look at that the roster, uh, minus a few players, would our, our AAA players, quote-unquote, would be better than the San Francisco Giants AAA players. And that was obviously not the case because not even our marquee players like Chu and Gallo, or Gallo had a decent series, but I mean our, our actual players that play a regular decent amount of time – they, even they didn't perform, and I, I don't know. It's just it's very alarming because the pitching was awful, just god awful against batters that weren't even batting above two seventy and and the minors for their career. I mean it it is it was just a bad look, and I hope that's just not an omen for the rest of the season. In a sixty game season, you have to look at the games more like football, where a lot of times, Which, whenever you consider like. The Cowboys are playing the Redskins this week. Or wait, wait, wait. The Washington football franchise. So they Get that sh- merchandise. So they should win. Like they, This is like one of those games where you circle the schedule. Like That should be a win. When you play the fucking Giants, who were in full-on rebuild mode, we're talking like they got Gabe Kapler, who bombed out of the Phillies. Mike Yastrzemski is their best player. He would be the fourth outfielder on most teams. They don't have Mad Bum anymore. I mean, these guys stink. And the Rangers lose twice to them, including getting nine and seven runs put up on them. That's a bad look. And then, for whatever reason, Arizona, like Oakland, no matter how good or bad they are, 
decimate the Rangers every time they played them. And the Oakland series was brutal. You had Matt Olson popping off. But I sort of expect the Rangers to lose to Oakland because I've been seeing it my whole life. These and they don't even have Chris Davis. Yeah, that Chris Davis. They don't have the Ranger killer. He started one game this series and, and had a huge like two RBI single that defined the game. And he, Chris Davis, his last couple of years has fallen off hard. The one thing he can still do is dominate the Rangers. I also heard a stat that in this last decade, like 2010 to 2020, no batter had a higher like home run per at bat with like an X amount of plate appearances against a certain team than Crush Davis to the Rangers. We thought Vlad Guerrero was the fucking Ranger killer. But... The, yeah, him and Vlad Guerrero and Crush Davis are probably the two biggest Ranger killers ever. Bernie, Will- it... Bernie Williams is up there too. Hopefully in the later part of uh, Chris Davis's career, he decides to join the Rangers as well and that was <laughs> perform like Vlad did for us. Yeah. But if you want to look forward into the Rangers' schedule, because after you get swept by Oakland, there isn't really much more to do than to look forward. You go out to the West Coast, you get embarrassed in San Francisco against a joke team, and then you get swept by your rival, and you consider okay, the top two teams out of each division make it, and there's a wild card. We're not going to beat Houston in the division. And when you get swept by Oakland, really, when you look at Oakland from a Rangers point of view, you're sort of saying to yourself, like, it's a long shot. Maybe going into the stretch drive, if they choke or have a couple of big pitching injuries, we could have money, a chance. Money but money Yeah, and they don't have a lot of resources. But holy shit, like getting swept by a team in a 60 game series that's like losing nine consecutive games folks that's really really bad and if you just watch these games so many of these ranger games the rangers will have one hit in the sixth inning it's a consistent thing the offense is so bad the lineup has so many holes in it let's just talk about some of the players in the lineup ben danny santana who for like three months last year was batting 330 and was very talented, and they batted him second. Yeah, exactly. Textbook overperformer. He's been an average player his whole career. He got hot for a few months, and then at the end of last season, started to fall back to reality. What do the Rangers do? We're not going to sign any of the premier free agents. We're going to lowball Rendon. We're not going to give Donaldson a competitive offer. And then you're left with pretty much just Todd Frazier. And that's what people were mad about Todd Frazier. It's not that Todd Frazier was bad. It's that Todd... Because now Frazier, he seems like a goddamn like fucking well, like god for us. Like well, He seems like the only one that can hit. Todd Frazier was always what Todd Frazier was, which was like above average. What happened was, is that new stadium, a lot of people saw the Kluber trade, and thought the Rangers are sort of like middling, and if they made a couple more moves, could make a big splash, move into the new stadium. You know, a, a big hype signing or a trade, such as Arenado or Rendon, would have made a huge impact. But instead, like not only is it no, like no Rendon, but Todd Frazier, it's just Todd Frazier. He doesn't get anyone else, JD. Oh, he trades for Kluber, but that's a trade. That's different. We had to give up DeShields and Class A, which like... Turns out that wasn't much, but still, in terms of free agency, JD really missed the mark. And that's why the lineup has so many holes. And I, going into the offseason, I, I didn't think that we had these many holes. Yeah. I, I, didn't think, I didn't think that there were th- these many positions that we needed to fill with actual professional players and not minor league players from our system. Because looking at the lineup today, or yesterday at least, and our, our batting eighth and ninth, we had Ro, uh, Ref Snyder and Scott Heineman. And I know Heineman's a, 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 pro, a good prospect, and he has hit a home run or two already. But th- the fact that he's starting in the 60 game season, like we don't have any better options. We don't have any better options. None. Well, no, we got we, okay, we to put Scott Heineman in. Oh, oh, oh uh, Kluber's hurt? All right, Kobe Allard, Albert, whatever your hell your name is. Allard. You want to go out there. You want to hear the disgusting thing to me is it's not the presence of those guys in the lineup. It's the performance of the everyday guys that we expected to actually be good. Look at Ru- Elvis, Ru- Gallo. Yeah. I mean, we can go down the list. Like, Rugi Odor. Like, we can just get him out of the way early. Rugi is Rugi. Highly undisciplined. Like, a sloppy player who is, like, never really going to develop like anyone expected. 
he's been kind of hurt, so like I, I'm just going to like throw him out. Like Chirinos, sort of this catcher who's expected to be good defensively and bat 220, and half of his hits are extra base hits. He's been terrible at the dish. Horrible. Like Mathis level bad. Shinsu Chu has actually been pretty good when he started, despite his batting average. He's having a hard time finding a rhythm because despite the fact that Chu is one of three professional hitters on this damn roster, Woodward benches him against lefties, like he's Giambi, and he has the 98 Yankees bench to pull from. Even Sh- though he could still probably walk once a game against a lefty. Exactly. Like if, if you just look at the Rangers' other options, like, okay, yeah, obviously Shin Su Chu, as a lefty, is worse against lefties than he is against righties. But in a team this experienced and this offensively inept, you can't be playing Earl Weaver and trying to platoon the guy that you're paying the most, other than Prince say, Fielder. But yeah, you got you, you so give, much yeah, money. You give Chu this big contract, and like everyone loves to rip Chu, and like yeah, the contract was probably a little too big. But when he's healthy, he's been effective, especially you, if you if you look at what you paid him to do, which is get on base. He's been effective. One, you you have convinced me over the years because I was like that. I did not like the Chu contract, but I, I I have come to respect his game so much more because of his on base percentage and because of his IQ and because he's Korean. I mean, adds into it. But second thing I was gonna say was back to Danny Santana. Danny is I, I'm glad that we kept him because Danny is a good utility player. He's like a like a, a poor man's Ben Zobris to me. Because the man can play in pretty much every position but catcher. Center field, middle infield, and pretty exactly. well, too. Exactly. And he, 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 exactly. He's serviceable. But the fact that the Rangers just thought, oh, well, he overperformed. I guess we'll keep him around as a starter and hope he overperforms again. Not just that, but the third place fucking hitter. It, it, it just shows how much that John Daniels just mailed it in by doing that. I mean, no real intention of ever getting a better replacement for that position or I mean, whatever position because Danny Santana is still, like you said, batting third. Well, it, and, and until most he got hurt, yeah. Yeah, but in most lineups, he'd be batting sixth or later. I mean... Well, it, to me, it wasn't so much of Santana specifically as far as like how he performs that made me mad because like you, I like Santana and was glad that we kept him and loved the utility he brings. And, and I, he's cheap. Yeah, and he had a good year last year. I'm not denying any of it. Here's what I have a problem with. The Rangers going into the season and saying, well, you know, Danny Santana batted 330 last year for a few months. So, like, not only is he going to, like, bat 330 this year, we're going to start him 155 games in center field. And, like, he's going to have steals. He's going to bat for that average again. He's going to have pop. And we're going to bat him third. And, like, this is our guy that we're going to base our offense around. Because Gallo, like, I love Gallo, but he still has too many holes in his swings. He's too many holes in his swing. He's too Adam Dunlike. He's too Walker Dong. He's too one-dimensional. And I love him. And, like, overall, he's a great player with his defensive range and his cannon for an arm. And he's walking a lot more, which, like, when you're a guy like Gallo and you're going to strike out 150 times a year, so much of it comes down to the walk. Because Gallo, like... That's what makes it worth it. People dream Gallo to, like... Turn into the bat two seventy. Well, two two seventy is like would be realistic. Two seventy would be like that in my eyes would be like realistically Gallo's peak and like a four hundred on base. But no, people think Gallo could bat like three ten, and like people who have been watching Gallo for five years are still sitting around and expecting him to turn into Babe Ruth and like bat well over three hundred. And you like, I mean, I'm serious. But to me, oh no, you're right. To me, like, I think Gallo is, like, a really athletic, like, Adam Dunn type. He's, like, Adam Dunn that's, just, like, a plus defender with, like, a good arm, which, like, definitely is a good player to have on your team. This is a guy that's going to walk in a couple years and get, like, money dumped on him and, like, oh. a lot of it. But see, like, you're like, yeah, I'm not – it sounds like I'm trying to degrade Gallo and I'm not. The point I'm making is, like, Gallo is a flawed player – and there's a reason you can't bat Gallo second or third. Remember when Bannister tried to get back Gallo second and it was a total joke? 
There's a reason why Gallo can't go any higher than fourth. It's because he's so flawed and he strikes out so much. And if you look at the rest of the Rangers lineup, Connor Falefa has been a pleasant surprise. You know it's bad when we're relying on our old kind of Khalifa from Hawaii to well last bat. he's batting like four forty four or something like he's I mean he's doing really good actually he's uh well he's not batting that high but you have to consider that last season three thirty three sorry last season they basically ruined Connor Falefa by trying to make him pitcher a catcher or catcher yeah and so I, I love to have Connor Falefa he is filling in. You know, nicely at third. It's weird because we talked about this earlier, but Frazier had to move to first, so that was sort of weird because he signed Frazier expecting him to play third, and it's like, well, Guzman and Bird are so fucking awful that it's actually better for us to, like, move you. Which apparently Frazier said that he was a super utility guy in the minors, so it's not as not as weird as it sounds, but... I do want to round us back up, though, to what we were... Uh originally talking about because we can go on forever and ever into the black hole of the Rangers roster but back to the schedule there's some things that I wanted to point out like you were saying how it's a uh, easy loaded first half of the schedule and then the second part uh, the second month of the schedule is really interesting to me uh, because there are only two games in the entire month that are not against AL West rivals which makes sense because of the 60-game condensed... Right, it's uh, either NL West or AL West this season. So what I'm thinking, and it might be too late now, like you're saying each loss is like counting as three, uh, or each each sweep is counting as three, is that if the Rangers could somehow pu- pull it back together this month and make it a decent effort out of this first month and actually perform against their division rivals, which is a big if... A big if. Each one of those games is going to be l- allowing them to either lose or gain ground directly against their rivals. And That's the true. thing that is especially important, which if the Astros get it back together, they're in second right now. We play the Astros three separate series in that in the second month. Th- the The first three games, fifteenth uh, through the seventeenth, and the last are four games, and two of those series are in Houston. So like you were saying, horrible comparison to the first part of the schedule where it's easy, but there's a chance that the Rangers could gain ground to get one of those playoff spots if they put themselves in that position this first month. Well, when you consider each top two teams in each division get in and there's two more wild cards, the Rangers could get in with 34 wins. Because you have to consider like the teams that they're going to be competing with, uh, like the White Sox or Indians, whoever gets third in that division, and then who? Seriously, think about it. Like, so I would just run through it real quick: the A's and Strohs, the Twins and Indians slash White Sox. Obviously, I'm going with White Sox. I'm going White Sox. Okay, well, like that's the trendy. Pick. I know, I know. And the, so the Indians theoretically would battle with, and then the East. The Red Sox have given up. Baltimore has given up. The Blue Jays are okay. They're like a dark horse, but they don't really have the pitching. Excuse me. The Red, Looking at the East, it's it's a mess right now. The, the Yankees are obviously nine and three, but then the, the other are, four teams are log jammed. The next best is Baltimore at five and six. Well, I and mean, the worst is Boston with four and eight. It's so early on; it doesn't like. It's, That's what I'm saying. That that division's that, always been a clusterfuck, but this that, year that it might be even more so. De- that, to me, that division's decided. Like that's the oh, most yeah, cut Bal- and dry yeah, Baltimore. division. Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore at the bottom. Yeah. That was They're second written. right now, buddy. They're second. Well, good for them. That was They beat the Marlins a couple times. That's fucking written in stone. Baltimore at the bottom of that division. But let, let, okay. let What about the ahead. NL then? What about the National League? Because it, I, I, I don't agree think with it's you. It's obvious. So but but like to wrap up the thought, that means the Rangers are competing with that third team from the Central who's not very good, and then like the Angels who like have no pitching. And that's it. Like to me, even as bad as the Rangers are, I honestly think they can still make the playoffs and get in as one of the wild cards. And guess what? It's a fucking best of three, and the Rangers could throw Kluber, Miner, and Lynn at someone. Not Kluber, but... Well, yeah, Kluber. He could be back by the end of the year. It's projected that 
Yeah, it's project. It's really? a yeah, it's a grade two grade two shoulder tear. It's a little bit more severe version of what Leclerc had. He could come back like, theoretically. He could pitch in that Houston series at home at the end. Now, obviously, it'll depend on the contact. If the Rangers are fucking twenty games below five hundred, he's not gonna like rush back for no reason. But True. if it's a big game, I mean, yeah. Same with Leclerc. He could be back by the end of the year. But like I he's, said, it's going to... He's gonna... on the 60-day list. Leclerc is? Yeah. Interesting. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, Leclerc's on the 60-day injured list. Oh, so... Which really sucks. Yeah, that was a huge part of the... The range. Oh, but at chances. least we have Edison Volquez back there with the gas canister and the... It's, the re- it's really funny to see Bannister's use of Volquez because he like puts him in these really tight big situations and I'm like Volquez is your fucking mop up guy he's awful and I actually heard the commentators say well since Bannister doesn't have a reliable lefty to go to then he Volquez is a really good change so he tries to use Volquez against lefties I'm like that's why you're losing games your tactic is to bring in Edison Volquez to get tough lefties out and not Martin like what like <laughs> Martin you're Chris Martin? Or Brett Martin, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think he's on the team. I thought he was. Brett Martin? I think but he, he do we, do we really do, do we really not have any better lefty options then? Well, it's it, Colby it Allard. Be Colby Allard, who was moved to starter. Oh, yeah, Brett Martin's on the roster. You're right. Well, he doesn't have any stats. I don't know what's... He might be That's hurt. what I'm saying. Unless if there's something well, wrong well, with he's, him. He's not, he's not like on the... He's not on the active roster, I don't think. No, he is. Well, like, I see him on baseball reference. I think he's on, like, the 40 man. I, but I'm looking at the active right now on the Rangers website. He's on the active, and they haven't used him. That's what I'm saying. It's like, how could you say Volquez is a better option as the lefty, like the lefty-lefty specialist than Martin, who is actually a, a lefty specialist? Like, I'm, I don't understand. I'm retarded I'm not, oh. and was looking at batting. Let's see if they've used him. Oh, if he's only pitched 1.1 innings. Yeah. Like, they've used him so little, I forgot he existed. You're dead on with this. So it just blows my mind that he would use Volquez in a lefty-lefty situation compared to the actual lefty-lefty specialist they have. That was, like, something the caster said, by the way. Like, that's not, like, my idea. Like, oh, God, I got the strat here. It's 1-1 against the, most, the A's in a must-win game. Go to Volquez. And then, like, he loads the bases, just throwing up all over himself. And Chavez, like, yeah, Chavez gives up the homer, but it's like... I'm not hating on Chavez nearly as much as Volquez. Like, and... Oh, neither am I. And if we're going to assess Chris Martin's managing, I think that Chris he, Woodward. Thank you. You said Chris Martin earlier, and you fucking got it in my brain. He got traded for Colby Allard. He's a brave now. That lanky oh. motherfucker. Yeah, he's Good for him. still a brave. And I'm happy for him. He gets to he'll probably be in the fucking playoffs. Playoffs. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh it's interesting to look at the Rangers roster now, even like what, like ten days, like two weeks after opening day and just reveling in how bad it really is. Did you know they sent Jose Trevino down today? Like, yeah. they, they had to cut roster spots. It was like, we're going to get rid of Trevino. It's like, Trevino? Let's keep Jeff You've got Mathis Jeff and... Mathis on the fucking team. <laughs> he's so like, he, he's He can so manage old. the pitching. He can manage the pitching really well. And it's like, it's like, it's like Mike, Mike Miner said that he makes a really, made him a really yummy grilled cheese in the clubhouse before the game. I don't give a fuck. He's 37. Well, He's setting records for the worst offensive performance of any player in a 150-year-old sport. So, well, you know. <laughs> I don't know why Vegas is going to have on odds. Like, will, will uh, Jeff Mathis be pinched hit for? Because I swear, every box lo- score I've ever seen in the past year, it's had him be subbed out in the seventh inning for – for someone else that can actually put the bat on the ball. It's funny because this season he's like gotten more hits. It took him like 
two months to get this many hits as he's gotten this season. He's like gotten a couple of hits at least, but because oh, he had a terrible start to last year and well, he had a terrible uh, season. It's not like he ever picked it up, but yeah, yeah. it was an especially <laughs> bad start. But to have Jet like this thing where the Rangers are like, oh well. It's almost, they're treating Mike Miner like he's Tom Seaver. Oh, I like throwing to Mathis. Okay, you have Connor Falefa behind the plate. Like, can't even figure out how to beat his fucking pads on. I see it, but with Chirinos back, you don't need Mathis. You don't need two veteran catchers, neither of which can hit very well. Chirinos is like a middling hitter for a catcher. Obviously, well, Mathis is a joke. but I would just get rid of Chirinos because at least Mathis is a solid defensive catcher. Trevino is a is known to be a more of a uh, offensive catcher and not as good as a uh, fielder, so I can see that. But you either, you keep, keep you two keep, old you keep aging one, yeah. ones. You, and in this team, this isn't a team like going to the stretch drive with like a three game division lead. This is a young team. Get Trevino on the roster. You don't need two fucking aging veterans. And I, Mike Miner got lit up today, again, like embarrassed, and he had his boy catching him, I think, didn't he? Yep, Mathis. Yeah, and then like... Because they, pin- they pinched hit for him. I remember that specifically. Wait, did he? Are you sure? I thought so. Well, anyway, Mathis got... Oh, I think I'm Maybe... on the wrong game. We like we need to wrap this because I keep saying like progressively more stupid things. Well, all right. I I would like to at least if we can uh, end it on one. Yeah, one you, point. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make as many make you can keep going. I I just wanted to bring up to you because a a lot of Ranger fans are already thinking it, and it's very reasonable, especially in a sixty game season because things are very weird. At what point? Do we start selling? At what point do we start just because you were right? Like, by the way, it, it was Mathis. I, uh, yeah, that, and that's what I thought. For. It's funny because I know these things, and I'm like, I'm gonna fact check, and then like I look at the wrong thing. I'm on Baseball Reference, and it won't let me go forward anymore. And I'm like, am I retarded? I swear to God, it was Mathis and Miner. But to answer your question, should they sell? I think when you look at this freaking lineup. And you see, like, what they're doing, it's very tempting to be like, yeah. Like, we have veteran pitchers, like, Lennon Minor, 200 plus innings, 200 strikeouts last season. Like, teams in a, a, like a best of three, best of five playoff format, teams are thirsty for starting pitching. It's going to be like season defining having starting pitching. And you look at a guy like Gallo, like, people are anticipating that like, he's going to get, like, 200 plus million, like, if I, I I love Gallo and I'm not I'm never one of these guys who wants to like fire sell everyone like jump jump to that option but if you're gonna sell sell like last year where you you trade Chris Martin good like you get Colby Allard back but like Hunter Mazzara this off season and that's fine but here's the thing Hunter Pence made the fucking All Star team and you couldn't get anything for him now he's back on the Giants. Yeah, it's like Hunter Pence walked for nothing. He was on the fucking all-star team. He was comeback player of the year. All of his like prominence and numbers were built early when it was best to accumulate his trade value, and you let him walk. And he only played like 110 games. Yeah, and he like, was... But his numbers were insane he for did, what he was playing. He, did, like, he, he was, didn't contribute anything in the second half anyway. Like, if you look at the Rangers last year... Who did? They won 78 games, and then it's easy to see... This Ranger team that wins 78 games, they don't lose a lot. And then you add Corey Kluber, it's easy to see how, oh, yeah, they can win 80-something and sneak in. All right, well, I want you to give me – oh, and by the way, uh, Chirinos was the one that pinched hit for Mathis today, struck out. Of course. Uh, but I want you to put you on the spot, and you can think about it for a few minutes, but who – who are your top three players on this roster right now that you would trade for for prospects? You mean like most value? Yeah. I mean, if well, maybe for value, but you want to keep them too. So if there's ones players that you want to keep... Ga- like, I, would, hey. I, would, I would trade Gallo. 
I would trade Maya really? and I would trade Lynn because you you're gonna get the most back for those guys. Yeah, like you can't you can't do. Half. I I'm not trading Gallo. I he want only Gallo has to two years around. left. He only has two years left. So are you? I w- give him the max. I'm the one. I say give him it. Why this team though? Ha- he's not because like, this, he's not a max player. The- so like, who, well, like, maybe not and, max, and, max, and but less, close to it. But unless Gallo like significantly improves over the next two years, he's not worth like thirty million a season. He's like his. I, okay, I agree with that. I agree with that. But he's hurt maybe all the like time. twenty-five or less. I want That's I want a, a player who I love to be around on this team, like Michael Young was, like Elvis is, like Ian was gonna be before they did what they did to him. I want him to be one of those kind of players for us because I love Gallo and we've wanted him to succeed I, I agree. all the way. I actually agree with you in theory, but here's the cold hard truth. They're not going to shell out the money. They're not going to do it. Who else are they going to give the money to? Who else on this roster are they like, going to give an extension okay, to? I'll answer that question for you. Gallo's contract is up in two years. They're going to give the money that they could have given to Gallo to whichever like used to be good starting pitcher it has recovered from Tommy John that last year. They're going to give money to two of those guys cuz that's who John Daniels pays. This guy's coming off of Tommy John. They could they could easily pay Gallo 30 million a year even if they even if he's not worth it because Shinsu Chu comes off the payroll next year and that's 21 million dollars that's freed up. So and, oh, no, I mean, the money's there. Like certainly the money's there and the Prince Fielder deals off the books. I'm not they saying will do it then. They I'm, will do no, it then. they they will let I promise you like they will trade him or let him walk. And like I wish that they would keep him. But they like, won't let him walk. They won't let him walk at all. You know if that that won't happen. They will definitely they trade might. him before that should happen. No, there's no fucking way. That'd be the biggest that would be worse than trading a rod for what we did. Okay, well, what are they going to wait until he's on his like last year of his contract and they're going to be 500 at the All-Star break and they're going to trade him for pennies? Because like that's almost like letting him walk. That's uh, that's that's why yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. But, but that's why that's I'm better than letting him walk. No, it, it's still it, better than- you're right. It's literally better than letting him walk. But I'm making the point: if you do want to blow it up and fire sell and get rid of everyone, you fucking do that when people have their most amount of contract years left. So it's not just oh here's a rental. You're gonna I get way less back for a rental. But you can blow the team up without actually removing players that you still want to keep around as cornerstones for that team. Right. And Gallo is the only player on this team right now that I see is that way. Yeah. Maybe Cal- maybe Calhoun if he can actually start hitting Develop- this year. He has one fucking hit this year. Like he's batting oh ninety one. Yeah. It's, Cal- it's Calhoun is Calhoun is one of those players where you've been sitting there and fucking waiting for him to like take the next step and develop year after year after year. That's how Mazzara was. Sitting there but last year Mazzara he was good. Year. Willie was good when he played last year. He was pretty good. And he was like Mazzara in that sense. But I don't know how much more he's going to develop. Because yeah. I'm not seeing it right now. Yeah. So I, ho- I hope that he can. But I, I want to close with this thought. Here's one thing. I, I just want to end with this about fire sales. It's very tempting when your team is bad or shitting the bed to say, blow it up. Yeah, like get rid of everyone. And then... That that fan who says blow it up and get rid of everyone is usually the quickest to stop watching. They'll stop watching for four years, and if they see the team starts oh. to pick up, then they're back on the bandwagon. But see, Astros fans. Yeah, exactly. And here's the crux of the issue, guys, is the fan who says, oh, blow it up, blow it up, we can't win, we're average, blow it up, like tank. That fan, if the team tries that, if they do blow it up, and it fails, see like 2011 Mavericks where they blew that core up and thought they could reload with free agents and that failed. Although that wasn't like a, that wasn't a full blow it up like rebuild because it's like really hard to take a championship team and like completely turn it to a rebuild. The point is the people who call for the rebuilds the loudest are never held accountable when the rebuilds fail. When the rebuilds sit there and a team sucks penis for a decade straight, that fan, the GM. yeah, that fan who sits there and is like, get rid of all the good players for nothing, like have no one comes to the game for five years because my draft picks, we're gonna hit all our draft, like when it, like when teams like the Browns fail and fail and fail and tank and shit the bed and still fail and fail, those fans who always call for tanking are never like. Yeah, I was wrong. Like maybe when we were middling, we should have went for it instead of like trading away everyone. 
Oh, but because it, it's never it's never the tanking that was the fault. It was the it was the picks in the draft yeah. that that was the fault. Exactly. It was the actual players that were the fault. It's, it was the people making the decisions that were the fault. It's not, not the yeah. people that were calling for all of that. Well, and, no, it, it's, and it's ideological too. It's not the idea to like lose on purpose and like put out a shit product on purpose that's bad. It's like well, like sure. we want to win. Like there's nothing worse than being in the middle, and like there is a lot of truth to that, but. On another regard, like, is there anything really worse than losing on purpose? Because most fans, like, won't, like, sit through that and put up with that. It's amazing how many fucking people who are the biggest Astro fans in the world and have Astro bumper stickers and you see them posting pictures from the games couldn't tell you a single player from the 2008 roster. They never heard of Wandy Rodriguez. Never heard of him. Never heard of Michael Bourne. They think of Hunter Pence as a fucking giant. I mm-hmm. hate those people. I detest those people. The yeah. hardcore Astro fans who saw games in the fucking Astrodome, I don't have any beef with them. And if you notice, those are the people who are like usually the most contrite when it comes to the Astros cheating scandal. It's like the new fan, the Bregman worshiper, who's like, oh, all the other teams are doing it. The other teams cheat too. And the ironic part about baseball fans wanting to tank so much for their teams is that we're we are in the league out of all the the four major sports in America, where <laughs> tanking means the, I mean it, it has the least rewards out of any league. Ding 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 NBA, ding ding. NBA, you get two rounds of, of good picks. When the picks uh, there. NFL, you, in the, the NBA, NFL. Zion drafted there, like <laughs> rookie me. season, he's there. And the MLB, the highly most touted, talented prospects, still have to sit in the minor leagues. NHL, Connor McDavid, best player right in the league the, now. But right to the NHL, instant impact, huge deal. Like Zion Williamson, like inst- like that. Remember how many games they lost when he was hurt? And he came back and they were like instantly above average. Yeah. Right out of college. Baseball. You have the biggest stars in the world, and it's like, oh, I'm so excited first overall. It's like, see, in three or four years. That's And baseball. that's what's sad is because jo- or our first-round pick last year, Jung. who is a Josh Young, not Jung. It's pronounced Young. Josh Young for Ranger fans out there. I know it's spelled J-U-N-G. Sorry, buddy. It's weird. No. But as you can see back here, I got a Texas Tech I represent that motherfucker. He broke so many records at Texas Tech. A power hitter and a contact hitter. Third both. baseman. And third baseman. <laughs> and the fact that I'm so excited for him, and he's a highly touted prospect, and he's still years away from even touching, I mean, a Texas Ranger jersey. At least uh, two and, years. And putting it on. Yeah, I mean. And this is like with no one at third. Like, <laughs> Exactly. And that's my point. Is that we had this whole gaping at third. But they only want to put Frazier there. No and he's, he, and you, remember, Young, he's not some out of high school, like, plucky young guy. He was Four a guy, year of college. Yeah, he's like an adult, and it's still a delay. Exactly. So, it, that's to bring it into one point, I just find it ironic that baseball fans love to blow it up and tank when it has the least amount of uh, Consistency. Rewards. Yeah, it's that you can hard. actually reap with the compared M- to the other leagues. With the NBA, it's like this guy's coming out of college this year, and if we get lucky and get a high pick, he can impact us in 12 months. With baseball, no. Like, they have to develop in the minors and stay healthy. And Name me one player who has. Because even people like Strasburg and Harper and Chris <clears throat> Bryant. Straight to the MLB. Yeah, I well, mean, there's not uh, – the, how how many people just went straight to the MLB? We had David – notably David Clyde. Are you familiar with his story? He was a first overall pick for the Rangers in 73 from Houston, straight out of high school. And, like, the Rangers couldn't get any attendance, and their owner, Bob Short, was like – Bring he, him up! He was, yeah, he was like a legit phenom. People were comparing him to Koufax and stuff. You know how some first oh, overall damn. picks are just, like, insanely dick road. He was oh, yeah. supposed to be the next big thing. And he came up and, like, he had a... Like, the Rangers were about to, like, go out of business and have to be moved because no one was coming. And they hyped it, hyped the shit out of his debut and he came and threw, like, five good innings. But, like, because they rushed him and he couldn't develop, he, like, fizzled out after three years. And famously, like, whenever he was starting to, like, shit the bed and go downhill, my favorite manager ever, who was managing the Rangers at the time, Billy Martin, this was in 74... 
said like I'm gonna skin I'm gonna send the kid back down to AAA. It'll be like one of those Beyond Scared Straight programs where like we show the young kid the hoodlums and get him scared and like get his act together. And the Rangers owner Bob Short was like, no, no, no. This kid's done too much for this franchise to be sent down, and like that ended up like <laughs> ruining his career because like he couldn't figure out his mechanics and was never the same. But like. And, and I, I asked for an example. Yeah. You gave me one there's, from '73. There's your one example, that the, and that was the outcome of it. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah, that exa- and that's the reason. That's in short why you don't rush prospects that hard. Is that like David Clyde is sort of the microcosm example of that. To uh, as we end up th- or end up th- uh, this podcast or close it up, because I have to check how much money I lost on FanDuel today. I want. I, I want to. Uh, bring my three people that I uh, think that we should trade. Okay, who would you deal? Because uh, looking at, just looking at these contracts too, Kyle Gibson is owed $10 million this year, $10 million next year, and then $8 million in a third year. I right, get rid of him. Jordan Lyles, $8 million this year, $8 million next year. There are some people out there that might give us a crap prospect just to relieve some cap room. And then I would say third, uh, I would probably have to go with uh, with Miner. Uh, I, I agree with you on that one. It's his, uh, his contract year. He's really done great for us. I've loved Miner these past two years, especially how he converted from a reliever back to a, a starting pitcher, and he did really good with it. But we need, to, like you said, we need to get the value for what he is and not just pennies and nickels at the end of the deadline. Here's the here's the closing thought of the podcast. The real reason why it's not so easy just to call for a tanking and a dumping of assets, and this is like a truly harrowing thought if you're a hardcore Ranger fan, is the Rangers' inability to develop even the most surefire prospects. The Rangers have had guys... Especially at pitching. Yeah, oh, especially at pitching. The Rangers have had guys that are legit highly rated top 10 in the whole MLB can't miss like prospects like you remember how like Fernando Tatis Jr. just got like dick road like infinitely for two straight years yep. like jerks and Profar was that guy five years ago people were pretending Profar was going to be a god people were pretending Ruggie Odor was going to be very very good Chichi Gonzalez, Martin Perez. I could on go, the Rockies. Yeah, yeah, I could go on and on and on. And if you look up the Rangers first, like just Google Texas Rangers first round picks, you read the list and it's like, holy Bubba shit. Bubba Thompson. Can't wait for Bubba Thompson to come up in five years. The funny thing about first round picks too is even if you're a hardcore baseball fan, you can read the list and like, you're like, well, I don't know him because he's straight out of college. Like, he hasn't even had a chance to make the MLB. And you read and read and read. And you're in 95, and you're like, I haven't heard of this guy. That means he never made the majors. <laughs> like, it's exactly. not because he's too green. Exactly. And to your point, another – I mean, our the last transaction the Rangers had, trading Ariel Gerardo was one of our top pitching prospects for the past couple of years. And – I, and I'm glad they got rid of him, Me especially too. the Mets. I can't believe the yeah. Mets took him. I love the, but, I, the the idea of the Mets beleaguered bullpen. Like, all right, we loved Bartolo Colon. This is like Bartolo Colon without the charisma or talent. Like, we're gonna, this is the guy we're going to have set up for fucking Edwin Diaz is like or Ariel Harado. And Ariel Harado is one of those guys I wanted to like so bad, and he same, was bad. Same. Bad. He was not even average. I think we were actually at one or two of his starts live at at the ballpark of Arlington, and my God, I don't think they lasted very long. Well, they did, but innings-wise, they did not last long. Yeah, it felt like hours because of how many walks he gave up. But I was just saying that to to prove or to accredit your point because we cannot develop players especially at the pitching position so and t- to me as a ranger fan that's why like remember you gotta be you gotta remember what you're saying when you say blow it up the season's over trade everyone you're putting your faith in this organization over here on the left side of the screen the likes the, the organization blake bevan michael main neil ramirez 
you know, even the, they, like I'm like skipping the guys they hit on. You want to hear the the Rangers' no, biggest I hits? Don't. Tommy, I don't. Tommy, big game Hunter. Hunter, like, oh god! Like for three years, like an average pitcher, nothing special. Justin Smoke, like a Walker Dawn guy who hit forty, like thirty god. homers a couple times. Tanner Shepherds, fraud. Shepherds might be just one of the worst players I've ever actually seen play. Oh my god! I I remember Shepherds and Perez, Shepherds and Perez. This was like the the This was the fucking ethos of like the idiot like plan trusting JD worshiping Ranger fan was like, don't worry, bro. When Shepherds and Perez finally develop, we're gonna be good. Like Matt Harrison career ending injury, like can't like no, it's fine. We got Shepherds and Perez. Anyway, this has been episode one of Agony's Embrace, the Texas Rangers podcast. I'm Venom Astaire. That's the king of funny. Peace out, everyone.